Hello Bits and Bones, my name is Lady V and welcome to my channel. Today I wanted to talk about milking franchises. My new library is sparse on content and not quick to get anything new. So when I want something, I have to put in a hold request behind 10 other people and then I get a vague estimation like you could get it in a month or maybe half a year. Who knows? So I've got a lot of those on the go at any given time and often forget what I have on hold by the time it actually becomes available. And surprise, surprise, a couple weeks ago I got a ding on my library app that said something was finally ready for me to borrow. And I'd completely forgotten that I ordered Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. It's really unfortunate that sometimes the hold that comes up is just wildly not my vibe anymore and I have to pass on it after all of that time waiting. But I was in a reading slump, so I shrugged and said, fuck it, let's get into it. And this is a hot take, apparently, but I really enjoyed The Cursed Child. It's clear this is one of those things people either love or really hate because there is so many one-star angry reviews for it on Goodreads, but I think a large portion of that is that they expected more from it and were too close to the grandeur of the original Harry Potter series to take this byproduct as the fun little spin-off that it was. The main criticism of The Cursed Child, as says every other comment on Goodreads, was that it felt like fan fiction. And I can't really fault them on that as the whole play is a winding adventure through various what-if alternate realities, but that's what I found quite enjoyable about it. Because as younger readers of Harry Potter, we all had our own idea of what life must have been like for the protagonists in the year to come, and it fulfilled that curiosity triple-fold. Where some people hated seeing the lesser versions of characters, like Ron as a slumpy middle-aged man married to someone other than Hermione, I really liked that. It felt realistic to include for the adult readers. That not everyone has to be a hero 24-7 for the rest of their life, and, and there's nothing dishonorable in who Ron was, even if it's not what other readers had come there to see. I thought it was pretty apt that Harry would be a kind of crappy dad superimposing what he thinks should work in any given situation while trying to connect with his son rather than see his son for who he was, and using that overshadowing as a basis for Albus's personality was a delightfully bitter character arc. But I digress. The second criticism against The Cursed Child is that it felt juvenile and characters weren't themselves, and I think that's more of a matter of opinion. We've elevated the Harry Potter series so high as individuals and as a society that I think a lot of us have gone blind to what it actually was. Originally, just a children's book. I thought the writing was quite charming in that witty adolescent way and I thought that suited it just fine. And in the end, the triple parallel of Albus, Scorpius, and Delphi all struggling to connect with their parents that feel so disconnected and out of reach because of who they were in the original series was quite satisfying. In terms of The Cursed Child as a play, I have no idea <laughs> how most of the magical stage direction would be possible, and it didn't feel like it was supposed to ever actually be a real play, so the format was something I just ignored. My biggest criticism is that it was so heavily reliant on already knowing the entirety of the Harry Potter franchise and its characters that this isn't something anyone else could pick up and just read if they've, you know, never encountered it before. And that's the direction I want to point us in now that we've gone over my general thoughts on The Cursed Child, which I gave a 4 out of 5. I want to talk about milking franchises because I think that there's a right and a wrong way to do it. Harry Potter and The Cursed Child was a 50-50 when it came to loving or hating it. And a lot of people said they hated it because it didn't align with their idea of the original work's tone and characters. But what made it work for the ones that did like it was use of previously established world history, for a sequel, cameos of previously established characters, but the plot was driven by new characters. Now, let's look at Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. To be frank, they pulled the idea of a trilogy for Fantastic Beasts out of their asses because Harry Potter was still a very marketable franchise and people wanted more. That said, the first movie in the trilogy is not bad. It's mediocre. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them was good in that it used previously established world for a prequel and the plot was driven by new characters. And it was bad because they shoehorned in previously existing characters. If Fantastic Beasts had stood entirely on its own as a man taming misunderstood and dangerous creatures that has to use those creatures to change the minds of stuffy politicians and save the day, that would have been great. But they had to tie in Grindelwald and Dumbledore's whole thing because that's the most well-known and speculated upon pre-Harry Potter series events people don't actually have a proper grasp on. 
And of course, the second movie, The Crimes of Grindelwald, was doomed to fail because it had to juggle the new cast of characters while leaning more towards including characters that we already know and somehow add in things new and exciting when actually it's a prequel. It's a fucking prequel, guys. Regardless of whether they should have tried to drag Fantastic Beasts into a trilogy, wanting to do anything more with the cast of it was an ambition that could never work. Why? Because all the new characters like Newt, Tina, Queenie, and Jacob aren't in Harry Potter. No matter how much we like them, spending more time with them is going to make the void of their existence in the original Harry Potter series all the stranger. Because you can't write them in. Harry Potter is already set in stone. Making endearing new characters in a prequel essentially feels like wasting your watcher's investment. And on the other side of it, because the actual goal of making the trilogy of Fantastic Beasts was to flesh out pre-established characters, aka Grindelwald and Dumbledore, it's not only hard to care about them because we already know them, who they are, and what they become, but being a prequel, it runs the risk of overwriting who they were in Harry Potter. And it does. It so absolutely does. There's a gaping disconnect between the people we see in Fantastic Beasts and who they become by Harry Potter. It also overwrites in that it gives us information we don't actually need, like Nagini being a cursed girl that turns into a snake when she sleeps or whatever. And then her and Ezra Miller go on a side adventure as misfits together, and it's just so unnecessary. It's like Fantastic Beasts wanted to give us more tidbits of lore to keep us engaged, but it just muddled up representations of characters that we understood just fine in the first place. I don't know about you, but I was satisfied with what I knew. I, I really didn't need that. I have put on and tried to watch Crimes of Grindelwald several times, and I think I made it to the end once, and I hated it because I had zero character investment or likability, and I've forgotten what happens. The other times I got too drunk to pay attention, and another I just fucking fell asleep. So what am I getting at here? Is this a matter of prequels inherently collapsing in on themselves? The Hobbit movies were a prequel to Lord of the Rings, and it wasn't very good. Stretching into three movies from one little book. Nobody liked the prequels to the original Star Wars trilogies either, if they'd already been fans of the franchise anyway. Maybe the problem is with overreaching. Those are all trilogies that fell flat, and God knows the new pirate movie sequels are a slap in the face to the original three. Don't even fucking get me started on the new Star Wars sequels. <laughs> that, that was a lot of, uh name dropping. But yes, I do think that's one of the factors of disaster that film studios keep falling into. Because it's profitable and not because they have that much content to contribute to the already loved and well-established franchise. They are definitely overreaching. But I don't think it's actually a matter of prequels versus sequels. It's just that prequels are harder to pull off because they can so easily step on their own toes and ruin aspects of the original beloved franchise that they're trying to add to. That's why The Cursed Child was easier to digest than Fantastic Beasts, at least in my opinion, because it was developing characters from Harry Potter in time. So it wasn't hard to accept that they changed into something I didn't expect or became something new. While on the other hand, if characters from Harry Potter were something that I didn't expect in Fantastic Beasts, it was just a bunch of backpedaling trying to get the new representation of a character they chose to add in to meet back up with the version that we already know, aka extra information that doesn't change anything actually. There are a lot of examples of shitty content backing off successful franchises that good content can be made. Just look at Rogue One, a one-off Star Wars prequel, Logan, an X-Men sequel, Milking a franchise can happen in ones, threes, befores, and afters. The takeaway today is that the best way to avoid watering down and ruining a legacy of great content is to make sure the spin-off can stand on its own. Does it have its own story, its own plot? Cameos and callbacks are great, but rather than lean on the crutch of past success, the best way to pay respect to a beloved franchise is to use the groundwork that it set up to build something else, something new. I hope this odd rant and conclusion has, at the very least, helped identify why some spin-offs work and some don't. It's not a formula, but as far as I can tell, it's held true for examples that I've come up with. Let me know any franchises you love that either rightly failed in making anything else in the universe, or tell me about a good spin-off that I missed because I can't think of any more. Anyway, as always, I'd like to thank you so much for watching, and special thanks to my patrons. If you'd like to support me and my content, there's a link to my Patreon in the description below. You can find my content posting schedule on my banner, and I will see you in the next video.
Bye.